What is Too going on? Like oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> What is going on, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Let's Talk Football Podcast 700,673. I am here today, unfortunately. Go on, introduce yourself. What is going on, everyone? Ginji X here. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not introducing it for once. I'm Kurt Yo, and you probably know who I am if you've watched all the other episodes. Unfortunately, we're not joined by J&O. Because he is uh, working, I think. He's working, working the late shift. However, next week, he will be on. That's, that is a promise. If he's not, then I'll run around the street naked. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> Kurt's going to run around the street naked. So, last week was an eventful week. I, I think we can agree. Yeah. A lot of stuff happened. Uh, so, we have a lot to talk about. So, get ready for your four-hour podcast with Kurt Yo and Gingy. Uh, so, I guess first place to start is the three games that I've um, I've highlighted. Uh, none surprise. I mean, I- I'm not surprised. So I've gone for Stoke one, Villa nil. Um... <laughs> <laughs> no, so uh, I'm going to start off. I'm not going to start off with the one I was originally going to start off. I'm going to start off with Arsenal three, Manchester United nil. Uh, yeah. Now. It's interesting because last week Sanchez, as we all saw, uh, had a very good week, you know, gaining himself a hat-trick. And Arsenal had, you know, they've had a pretty decent two weeks, I guess you could say. 5-2 against Leicester and 3-0 against Manchester United is a very good sort of two weeks in a row. So, Sanchez, is he back for this season, Kurt? What, what do you reckon? Is he is he starting to hit the form he's been showing from last year? or? Well, I think it was only a matter of time because Sanchez shown throughout last year he's got quality he can produce and I think generally he just needed time to sort of fit into you know the player he was because of, you know maybe you know you could say lack of energy you could say lack of playing time uh, but we've seen in the last two games if he's got to the form in which that we all expect of a Sanchez sort of um, performance which is just terrorizing the opposition and it shows because especially against Manchester United it showed a Sanchez, you know, on his day, is destructive, and B, when Arsenal play Man City, and Sanchez plays against Aguero, a footballer nuclear bomb is going to go off <laughs> when they collide. Yeah, no, that, that that is something that could happen. I mean, that's something that I'm going to have to lock lock my room and everything just to start. <laughs> you know, I might even have to book the day off work if I'm working, <laughs> <laughs> just for that match. <laughs> But yeah, uh, I, I think it's good for Arsenal's sake, of course, that he's back. I mean, quite early on in the season, you could tell that there was a spark missing because he was something that was very key for them last year. You know, having Sanchez on their team on their team must have just been unbelievable at times. I mean, yeah. I can't really imagine how much of a lift he gives to players when he's playing like this. But you know, it's good for their sake that he's back. Uh, that has to be said for sure. Yeah, definitely. I think the Arsenal game in general. I mean first 15 minutes in which where they scored two of the goals and a few minutes after they scored their third goal 77 percent possession yeah no i i did notice that that's actually my second note i said arsenal showed dominance in the first 20 minutes with over 75 percent possession yeah <laughs> that 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 is how you win a game <laughs> if you can control the game for 20 minutes and take your chances like they did it's it's an unbelievable way i mean I was very surprised because I actually looked at the uh, full-time stats and Arsenal actually ended up having 38% possession. Well, that's because the, the, you know, when United get into the game, they spend, you know, 85 minutes just passing it, you know, across their defence, you know, and as soon as give it to Michael Carrick if he's playing, it goes straight back to the goalkeeper. So, like, oh, can't we get forward? <laughs> Carrick's time up, Carrick just kicked it back to his own goalkeeper. Carrick, Carrick could be four on goal and he'd turn around. Around the keeper, just turn around and just boot it back to De Gea. It's, it's yeah. ridiculous at times. <laughs> um, so the, I've also ruined my next um, thing as well because I said Arsenal took their chances, which they did because they only had five shots on target, which was actually the same as Manchester United, uh, but they scored three goals from their shots on target. So it's actually yeah. quite, you know, it, it it does make a massive difference, doesn't it? Really, when you have the ability, when you've got the players that will take the chances. I mean, Sanchez getting two, and Ozil actually getting one as well, which is also good to see because he's one of those players that can be fantastic one week and absolutely abysmal another. So, yeah. of course, for Arsenal's fans, it's very good. So, I don't know if you've got anything to say on their chance taking. Or... Ozil is 
constantly been criticised in the past for, you know, his uh, a stat that is, you know, very important to us football manager, you know, I'd say, I wouldn't say, you know, a football manager like, addicted to it, and it's the big game, you know, stat, do they perform oh, in yeah. big games? Big Ozil game has constantly been criticised for, you know, lack of good performances in the big games. In that game, he was... For me, one of the best players on the pitch because he could not be stopped. His passing, you know, was what you expect of a Mesut Ozil game. Exquisite. He scored the goal. He had well, he had Manchester United, you know, scared. And their back four of um, Darmian, who is, is an okay right back, we had a shocking game. Minus one points in the fantasy Premier League got taken off at half time for Valencia. Smalling is probably the only defending defender you've got, and then you've got Blind, who's a midfielder, and Young, who's a winger, in the back four. You know, Ozil can exploit that all day and he showed how good he can be when he's on his A game and shows that he does have a big game statistic to him. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. But I also think that um, he's one of those players that, well, he's gained that physicality that you need in the Premier League now, which is what we were speaking about with Lamella last week, of course. And it's something that Sanchez and Aguero already had when they came over to the Premier League and Tevez as well. They've all got yeah. that big sort of build to them. And Ozil's starting to get a bit stronger and a bit bigger. And that's why he's going to start performing a bit more in these big games because it's something really important. It's a really underlooked sort of, a, I guess you could say, ability that some players have. Just the ability to hold someone off for a few seconds while you've got hold of the ball and then you can release it much easier and he's yeah. definitely showing that he's gained from playing in the Premier League yeah I think there's well there's two other key things for you know both Arsenal and Manchester United fans Arsenal you could comment have they finally found their best 11 and you know with their best 11 can they challenge for the Premier League Cause this is the Manchester United team that you know in previous weeks have been maybe you know maybe they've got you know a chance and going over to Manchester United saying Arsenal found their best team Manchester United are still nowhere near that. And if you, you know, you're three 0 down at half time, if you're going to take off, you know, a, a world what, considered a world class right back for a winger, and you're going to take off one of the Europe's best wonder kids, on the, one of the Europe's best wonder kids, one of Europe's best young wingers, for Marouane Fellaini, <laughs> it, it shows that they have not got the numbers. And for, for me, I think their best eleven, they that they. If United are going to get top four, um, they I think they will still get top four if they're going to challenge any further than that. They need to make you know, three, four more signings in January because their squad is so, so sparse and it's nowhere near you know title challenging as we've, we've seen by Arsenal brushing them aside. Yeah, I wouldn't say that they've got a problem in sort of challenging for top four because they'll definitely get that because the, there's actually, despite the Premier League being a very sort of close-knit sort of... Um, uh, how shall I put it? It's close knit league in ability. There's still another. They're still on another level compared to the likes that should be challenging them, like Chelsea, not Chelsea, um, Spurs and um, Liverpool. Yeah. I still say they're on another level compared to them. But anyway, uh, let's move on to my last point of uh, Louis Van Gaal's army finally falls. Louis Van Gaal's army. Thank you. Um, it finally falls, it finally falters um, after, you know, hitting some good form recently. Uh, yeah. I, I was glad to see the end of the... Um, Louis van uh, Gaal's army! Thank you. Because uh, <laughs> I'm not... A f I don't like Van Gaal's style of football. I've said it in a numerous amounts of episodes now, so I don't need to say it anymore. Let's move on, unless you've got anything else to add. Uh, all it needs is a few tweaks for me, because... Is very effective because you saw like the first 15 minutes they had 76.5% possession. That's exactly the stat they're showing on BBC Sport. End of the game, they started with 62%. If they can start off games like Arsenal did, you know, pressurise them. You've got a weak defence, you know, a, a very weak defence, you know, height wise, because I don't think it. I don't, did Dar how tall is Darmian, do you know? Uh, I, mm, I want to say six foot, but. He's still not the you know the the six two six three where you consider like a, a tall defence. They've got Smalling there. You've got a very weak uh, strength wise, height wise, pace wise even um, defence because Darmian isn't the fastest. Neither is Blind. And look at that. Arsenal did something very well. So they pressed forward and they got a few quick goals. If United can do that, the Louis Van Gaal style of play, um, when they dominate the game, is will come into effect if they get two goals. They can see out games from like the first ten minutes, 
It's just they start like that, and as soon as they concede, they're in trouble because they have no other way of playing football except the boring passing way across the pitch and complain they haven't had any shots. For me, yeah. that's the only problem. They don't start quick enough. No, yeah, I, I can agree with that. I can relate to that with quite a few teams not starting quick enough and things like that. But, you know, I, I think that the style of play is very negative to the starting fast sort of way, I guess. But anyway, uh, so we don't get caught up in abusing Man U <laughs> for once, uh, let's move on into the next game, which is going to be Chelsea 1, Southampton 3. Uh, so it's the return of Chelsea bashing episode 700, <laughs> 700,673, like I said earlier. So um, what do we have to say about Chelsea this week? Because once again, they have been absolutely abysmal. Um, yeah. To, to lose against, you know, to have gone from winning the league to losing 3-1 at home to Southampton is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, it, it's something that... Is it's not feasible, really? When, you, when if you think about it, it's something you can't be doing as the current champions. But I don't know. What have you got to say about it? I I've lost for words, really, for how badly they've been performing. Well, I did do a quick video, or I did a quick free videos on a few things over the weekend because I knew the podcast was going to be long. So I thought, I, uh, even if I do videos on it, there will still be loads to talk about. I did a video um, solely focusing on Mourinho and where things are going wrong at Chelsea. For me, you know, a lot of criticism is coming in, you know, from uh, players, well, uh, notably John Terry. Not only because he's an absolute prick because he parks in disabled bays, um, which is, you know, inexcusable. Um, it's the fact that I feel like he's a great defender and when people say he hasn't got the legs, he can't play, which I admittedly I fall into that sort of hole. I don't think much can be put, or much blame can be put on him for the simple reason that you see, you know, teams like Arsenal, they get decent amount of clean sheets and they've got Murtasaka at the back. Murtasaka is not the quickest. You look at Crystal Palace's um, defence. Crystal Palace have players like Hangelan, like Scott Dan. They're both not very fast. It is, it's all about the players around them, you know, and when you've got no legs, you need, you know, two full-backs that are going to support you and you need midfielders in front of you that are going to support you. Chelsea's problem is that they play Matic there, who for some reason is not looking like the Matic of last season, dominating players, you know, out strengthening players, passing the ball, getting attacks forwards. You've got Aspilicueta on one side, who admittedly probably is the only player that hasn't done much wrong, except for the fact he uh, maybe doesn't get back enough, concedes a lot of goals. And then you've also got Fabregas, who is no way a defensive midfielder, you should not be playing next to Matic, you need to have someone like Ramirez there to have the energy, and you've got Ivanovic, the other side, who again I did when I re Are you okay? Oh, I smashed my elbow against the wardrobe <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Carry on, sorry <laughs> um, the, the problem is, that, well the defensive problem fall, does fall to Matic, but, uh, not Matic, but um, Ivanovic, he Quite honestly, to put it uh, uh, to put it in my um, perspective, I felt like he was awful. He had another game week where he showed he 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 was absolutely cumbersome. He was constantly on the floor. He should have given away, he should have um, had a yellow card, given away a penalty. I think it was him that pulled Van Dyke's shirt. You know, as well as one of two Southampton penalty claims, he was constantly flawed. You know, Tadic put him on the floor a few times running there. Mane was constantly abusing him. Even Pella, when he came out a few times, he would abuse him. And for me, you've got to get rid of Ivanovic. You know, he started so many games for um, Mourinho. He's been, you know, quite a servant for Chelsea and Mourinho. But there's times when you think you need to get out of the first team because he's in horrific form. He's in yeah. absolutely god awful form. And I feel like if, you know, Terry can play, because Terry hasn't had, it's not this season we're noticing, oh, Terry finally hasn't had the pace. Terry hasn't had pace for the last good three, four seasons. It's the fact he's had players around him to help protect him and the teams help protect him to, you know, nurture and help his defensive ability shine through. With Ivanovic, he's constantly out of position, constantly getting beaten. That means that if Terry's next to Ivanovic, he has to shift out. Kale then has to shift out. There's then space for players to run into next to John Terry. And it goes downhill from there. So 
for me, Ivanovic needs to go. Get Baba in left back. Stick Aspilicueta right back. Something needs to happen. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I think that uh, Ivanovic has to go because you cannot carry on playing a player. I've said it a number of weeks now. You cannot keep on playing a player if they're playing like crap because they're just yeah. going to think, well, you know what, I can keep on playing like this and I'll get picked every week. It's where he's already gone wrong there just by doing that because it's just such a negative mindset to have. But it, I just feel like he's gone past the point where he can actually help himself anymore. It, mm. it just, you know, because he's, he keeps on picking the players that are playing absolutely terribly. Like, it's not like they're having, oh, the odd bad game. Like, th did Hazard even show up again? I mean, that's Hazard another thing. Did, uh, he, he showed, you know, glimmers. He won the free kick, and that's about all he did. You can't really say, though, by showing glimmers that he's there, because I would say that just by showing glimmers of something, I mean, most players do that every week. Yes. But... You know, I think that Chelsea have just gone past the point. I'd say past the point of caring, but it's obviously not that. But, you know, the thing is that you're saying about um, height and ever uh, Sorry, not height. Uh, pace at the back. Hmm. Uh, Terry's pace has, of course, shown for a number of years. But, however, I think that height is also a big issue for Terry. Because unlike the likes of Hangeland, Mertesacker and Dan, he's not six foot five plus. That's a good point. He is what six foot three, six foot four, something like that. Yeah. He 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 hasn't got those extra few inches that those players have, which is why they don't struggle as much, I would say, because they've always got that slight height advantage. But yeah. of course, I'm not excusing that why Terry is playing terribly. I think that Chelsea needs to buck up their ideas, start playing the players that deserve to play, like Baba Rahman. You know, give him a chance. As Pelicueta at right back, like he used to play instead of Ivanovic being there. Uh, given the likes of Kurt Zuma a few games. I mean, he's not been brilliant, but I would say the Zuma and Cahill partnership has worked much better than the uh, Terry and anyone partnership. <laughs> uh, I thought that Ramirez was really good the other day when he came on, when he scored the goal uh, uh, Newcastle. in the Newcastle game. Yep. Uh, and he actually looked dangerous throughout that Newcastle game. Yeah. Uh, so Ramirez and Matic is definitely the partnership that you want there. You want Hazard to play on the left... Fabregas in behind, Pedro on the right, or whoever, Oscar, or however he wants to do it, and then up front, well, Falcao. Uh, but you, ne you need... Falcao? Uh, oh, well, Costa's suspended, isn't he? Oh, OK, I thought you were going to... Just going to I'm not talking point. about in the future. Oh, okay. uh, Costa all the way, but I would play Remy over Falcao, but um, Mourinho seems to have a sp soft spot for him. Uh, which brings me on to my next point. Um, Mourinho out question mark it's a tough one uh, definitely a tough one because one thing that Mourinho has done in the past he's done sometimes this season is that you know he will quite often you know his team will have a poor game you know he did it um, when he finally lost his first home game at Chelsea I think that was against Sunderland a few years ago wasn't it yeah that they played quite badly. Sunderland overpowered them, but they highlight the fact that Chelsea maybe were a bit weak in positions. And that was, I believe, that's the same game he had his four things to say speech. Yeah. And the thing that people don't realise about that speech is that that speech was made to take away a lot of the, um, you know, media and a lot of the spotlight on the fact that Chelsea lost their first home game because all of it was on. Mourinho, what is he doing? All this um, nonsense, rah rah rah. He tries to do the same thing this um, this week, and he says like, again, uh, another another week where he said the referees are afraid to give decisions to Chelsea. My poor, um, probably just Middle Eastern accent, if you think got it. <laughs> Which it's it's a load of rubbish because if if the referees were scared to give decisions to Chelsea, you know, and they're scared to give decisions in general. It would have ended up 5 2, not 3 1. Because Southampton had two clear ones. And for me, you look at Falcao's chance, he's already falling when contact is made. He's anticipating it, he's falling over. And I th at the time, you look, watch it full speed, you think, oh, it's a penalty. You watch the replay, and you think, the referee, credit to him, has got that absolutely spot on. I think that was a fantastic call. The um, So. For me, Mourinho is just trying to take um, the bad press 
off of his own team and off the, you know onto him just so they can forget about it it's not working chelsea you know as much as you know we've said it for weeks chelsea are in crisis you know and of course mourinho hasn't got much longer left as chelsea came out recently and said we have full confidence in jose mourinho that's it you guys will just quit just, it's not going to work out every time that happens you get sacked in the next month that, that is actually uh uh, someone else did actually say it to a manager once and then sacked them like two weeks later, didn't they? <laughs> yes. the, the, I, I do remember that. I can't remember what manager it was, but they did say we have full faith in this manager and then they sacked them two weeks later. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Mourinho out. Uh, I <laughs> I don't give it long before there's some Chelsea fan that will uh, decide to put the banners up in the stands. I don't know if it's already <laughs> happening, but Maybe. there'll be someone that does it and then it will just create this ripple effect across the Chelsea fan support yeah. because it's one of those someone has to do it first before everyone follows yeah. um, weirdly, I think sorry weirdly I, um, I, I was talking to my mum about it and my mum made a very good point about Jose Mourinho that she would like to see because the point she said is Jose Mourinho has always walked into clubs that are pretty much perfect or just need a little like a small little bit of fine tuning and then he can be successful at them. Never has Mourinho managed a club that needs a whole lot of change. This is probably the first time in his whole career, barring maybe the clubs he was at and the club he was at before Chelsea, this is the first time in his career where he needs to pull something out of the bag and show he's the special one. Yeah. And, and I, I agree with that. No, that, that is a very good point. I've never really thought about it that way. Like, and this is coming from someone that always criticises managers for walking into clubs without uh, having to do much of a hard job. But, um, yeah, I've never really thought of it from that way because, of course, you think Mourinho has won all these things and you never really think about the fact that he's had all these players at his disposal. I mean, even at Inter Milan, he had quite a few good players where he didn't have to change much to, you know, challenge. Um, but, yeah, that's that's a very good point. Um my opinion of the Mourinho situation is that, uh, how can I put this? I think he's lost his mojo. Uh, I don't think the players... Uh, bless you. Uh, uh, I don't think the players are really getting motivated too much by him anymore. Like, he's really struggling to push his players into, you know, into the next sort of phase, I guess you can say, in the match where if they take the lead, you know, push them on to get another or if they can see to get them back into the game and push them. Yeah. Uh, I'm just having a look at the table now. Uh, Chelsea have actually got eight points, one, two, lost, to, uh, one, two, drawn two and lost four. Yeah. That's, that's more than they lost all of last season already. But they scored 12 goals, which isn't terrible. Um, but they've conceded 17. Now that does highlight my next point, which is the defence is a clear weakness for them. And it's yeah. not just the defence. I'm not firing shots at Begovic here, but you do have to say if Courtois was in goal, you would think that maybe they would be kept in the game a little bit more just because Courtois, having him in goal, he's an inspirational goalkeeper. He might give them that little bit more of a push which is something that they had last season, because if Courtois was injured, they had Czech. And even then, that's like, oh, that's still an amazing goalkeeper to have coming in. But this year, yeah. they don't have that. And I'm not saying that Begovic is a terrible goalkeeper, because he's not. He's a fantastic goalkeeper, but he doesn't have that stature that Petr Czech had. That same sort of international reputation. Yeah. But, you know, Chelsea's sitting in 16th at the moment. Uh, thankfully, if they if they do lose next week, uh, not next week, the week after, and Villa win, they won't drop into the bottom, you know, the bottom three yet. Thankfully, <laughs> but um, you know they're they're pushing it. They they're really pushing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually really enjoyable to look at. But however, I do remember a few years ago Spurs being in this situation. They then sat their manager, got in a new manager, and they ended up finishing fifth. So, yeah, you know, maybe you can learn something from the. Spurs rabble, I guess you could say. Um, <laughs> poor Spurs. Yeah, poor old Spurs. Yeah. <laughs> Bloody sitting in eighth. I do like the look of that table, to be fair. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, and my last point is Falcao sucks. I agree. He <laughs> is absolutely terrible. He is not built for the Premier League. He was brilliant in the League of Portuguese up because, well, pff, look at the defenders. Um <laughs> 
He was brilliant in the BBVA. Once again, he's not playing against fantastic defenders every single week. However, he was very good against the likes of Barcelona and all that. But, you know, against Barcelona, he was playing against Mascarano. <laughs> Slight height advantage. I, uh, not even a height advantage, actually, because he's, he's actually quite a small Falco, isn't he? Yeah, I think he's, he's under He's five like five foot, foot nine, isn't he? Yeah. So, he was good in the air still somehow. Falcao is just not built for the Premier League at all, and he's going to end up going back to the BBVA a little bit like Soldado, and he'll probably be all right, to be fair. <laughs> just just all right. He'll, he'll be all right. He'll, he'll do okay, but you know he's got to go back before he ruins his career there. <laughs> uh, that's all I've got to say on Chelsea. Um, uh, it, oh, Jesus Christ, we took 16 minutes talking about bloody Chelsea. Yes. Uh, we haven't said anything about Southampton. Southampton performed very well once again. That is actually their yeah. second win on the trot. So that you know, all, all tops to Southampton there. Uh, they did very well there. And even when they lost three two to Man United, they didn't exactly deserve that either. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so let's move on to the big game of the week. Um, Bournemouth one, Watford one. <laughs> Manchester City 6, Newcastle 1. Now, I've got an interesting story about this. So I was at work. Uh, ouch, again. I've just hit my elbow. Um, I was at work again. I always miss the fantastic weeks of football. I miss all the good stuff. So I was at work. I was sitting in the staff room talking to, um, believe it or not, one was West Ham fan who was opposite me and the other one was a Sunderland fan. So... You know, oh, that... Sunderland fan? Why are they doing this? Yes. <laughs> I've got a Sunderland fan at work. So... Are they lost? <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I think he's uh, from Newcastle but anyway okay. let's carry on uh, I was up there and I got up there for about half time because that's what I like to do I like to take my lunch at half time watch the second well not watch the second half but keep up to the second half and I was just on my phone on Twitter because it was faster than the Sky Sports and um, I was like oh uh, so I didn't realise that City went in at 1-0 and then had a look ten, five minutes later oh 2-1 City Two minutes later, oh, it's 3 1 to see Aguero again. Um, uh, actually, did he score the third one? Yeah, he scored the third one. Yeah, okay. Right. And uh, then I was like, okay, Aguero hat trick. And then I was like, oh, and it's 4 1. <laughs> Aguero scored his fourth or something. And then someone else scored. I can't remember who. Now, De Bruyne scored the fourth for 53rd minute, and then it was Aguero in the 60th. Okay, yeah. And then I was like, and then Aguero got the sixth. And I was like, uh, so. Um, it's sort of 6-1 and Aguero has scored again and then Pellegrini the killjoy <laughs> had took off Aguero and brought on Wilfred Boney to defend out his 6-1 win it's, <laughs> ab <laughs> it's absolutely terrible I wanted Aguero to break the all time goal scoring sort of record in one match yeah. which I, is I believe is, it is 5 goals I yeah. wanted to get a 6 because it was only the 60th odd minute and the form that he was on, he was bound to get another one for sure. And Pellegrini just ruined it. So I'm going to have to recreate it on Football Manager just to relive that moment. <laughs> but my first uh, heading is Aguero! <laughs> so, yeah, uh, Aguero was unbelievable. Um, I've spoken a lot, Kurt. What do you think about Aguero? <laughs> I'm quite glad he came off because I'd already lost by quite a disgusting margin of 61 points in the um, head-to-head -head on Fantasy Premier League because the guy I was playing against had Aguero as his captain and also Sanchez in his team and I end up on 13 points. He got 100. So I don't care about Aguero coming off. That helped me not get Jesus. embarrassed. I mean, I did get embarrassed. 61 points difference is quite horrific. But, uh, whatever. I don't care. But Aguero, I think, shut, okay. again, it was a bit like Sanchez. Once he's, you know, match fit and he's like 110%, you know, you get games like this. But is it was it all Aguero or was it the fact that Newcastle for a good forty minutes looked like the Newcastle of a, quite a few years ago that were strong at the back and then looked like the Newcastle of John Carver and Steve McLaren's time falling apart in defence? It's a mixture I would of say, both for me. Yeah, I would say it's a mixture of both. Uh, but I would say it's not only the fact that Man City were exactly you know it wasn't all Aguero, it wasn't all that, but. David Silva was back, and David Silva got two assists in that yeah. match. So I would say that that played a key part in it. Uh, not only that, but you've also got the likes of Navas actually chipping in for once. De Bruyne getting two assists and a goal. So you know it, it was it was not exactly like 
it was one thing from one player or anything. Uh, Guerrero, of course, was the main headline, of course. But Silver and De Bruyne chipping in with two assists each is very good, of course. And a goal yeah. for De Bruyne. So it wasn't exactly a one-team effort. And imagine if company was playing as well. They could have kept a clean sheet because Mitrovic, you know, it was good to see him score finally yeah, for the sake of, sake, sake of his yellow cards uh, at the <laughs> moment. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, it, it was good to see Mitrovic scoring, Wijnaldum getting another assist. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, I've not got much to say about how badly Newcastle played because I think Newcastle still suck. Because how... Yeah. I mean, I, I'm about to actually be quite um, hypocritical here, but uh, Newcastle were 1-0 up and ended up losing 6-1. How you can be... I guess you could say sort of quite defensively sound and then just throw it away in the space of 20 minutes. It's just unbelievable. Uh, and you may be wondering why I'm being hypocritical, and that is because West Ham actually did the same thing against Arsenal about two, three years ago, where we took the lead and then conceded five goals in the space of 20 minutes. Interesting fact there for you all. Um, so my next point is, is this what City needed to get back on the bandwagon? Well, City are going to win the league again. And that's good to see. Now they've won well, again. Okay, the brilliant. Again. Brilliant. Oh. You've just you've just taken away my last one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> just go and carry on. I'm, <laughs> I'm angry now. <laughs> but um, you know, just quick question. Um, oh. Oh, he joined. Whoa, you can't do this. I I meant to be in charge. Oh, hang on, and I'll be right back. One second. Yes. <laughs> I'm back. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, Jesus Christ. All right, sorry, I had to sort out a family thing. Yeah. <laughs> God, I hate my, that word. Ugh. Yeah, ba basically, my sister uh, hasn't told us where she is, so uh, I had to call my dad and ask my dad, and she's at football training, uh, was the end result. But <laughs> anyway, uh, where were we? Um, I was about to ask you a question. Okay, what is your question, good sir? Um, just a bit of <laughs> trivia. Where Ooh. I scored five goals, four other players have yeah. done it. Who are they? Alan Shearer. Yeah. Is one of them. Yeah. Uh, oh, God. I saw this the other day. Um, Alan Shearer. Thierry Henry? Nope. No. Okay. Ouch. Uh, right. I hit my elbow again. You can again. have two more guesses. There's four of them. And you have four guesses. You have one right, one wrong. Alan Shearer. Um... Oh, there's one that's like, I looked at it and I was like, I don't remember him being, scoring many goals. Uh, no, I, I ain't got nothing. Suarez? No. Oh, what, really? No, never scored five. Uh, he got four, he got four, he got four, four and an assist. Um, uh, I'm going to go for Michael Owen. No. Okay, right. I suck. Alan Shearer I got was one. one. I got one. I know that. Um, the most recent one, Dimitar Berbatov. Oh, yeah. He scored against... Uh, Blackburn, wasn't it? Yeah. Like no, that. I remember that one. That, that was one of them. That was the one that I was like, did he really score five? Then I remembered he was good once. <laughs> On the other <laughs> game. Yeah. Um, I think I'm guessing the most recent one after that, or before that, um, Jermaine Defoe. Ah... That's what, uh, I knew it was a small English striker, that's why I said Owen. <laughs> ah, right, go on. I was looking to see who that was going. It's Wigan. Wigan, And yeah. the last one is uh, probably the, I'd say the oldest of the lot. 
Uh, Andy also, Cole. Yes, Andy Cole. Yeah, I remember that one now. Andy Cole. <laughs> that was against Ipswich. I know that one. Yeah, that must in be the, quite a while ago because uh, Ipswich the... haven't been uh, around up there in ages. I think that's the game up there where he, in the, uh, <laughs> the game where he, the nine um, one to Manchester United, I think, or nine nil. One of the biggest results in the Premier League history as well. Yeah, not not a bad scoreline really when you look at it, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's all I wanted to say really before you ran off. Yeah, yeah so, sorry about that, guys. Um, <laughs> so I guess it's time for. Me to run through the results as will they still win the league? It's gone out the window. Uh, my my, qu- I still think they're going to win the league. I didn't doubt them at any point during the season. Never. It's either Man City or Palace. It's one of the two. So um, actually, to be honest, the way Arsenal have played the last few games, I, I wouldn't, you know, say that they're far off. Uh, if, if Arsenal get a good result against City, all of a sudden the pressure's on City. Yeah. Um, uh, and who have Arsenal got in the next game week? Um, I don't that is, know. That's Arsenal. a good point. They Arsenal. have an away trip to Watford. Well, Watford don't score goals. And don't concede goals at home. I think in, in the whole of the season goals. so far, they've scored one and conceded one at home. But have they played against Alexi Sanchez yet? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good also, point. Joe Aguero. So, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll leave it at that and then we'll get back to that uh, next time. So... Let's have a quick run through of the week's results. <clears throat> Crystal Palace 2, West Brom 0. Palace once again asserting a form of dominance, a sign of dominance, I guess you could say, um, after, you know, I've been quite a very good start to the season in fourth place under the man, the myth, the legend, the Um Yeah. Next up, Stoke 1, Villa 0. Stoke follow their first win of the season. With their second win of the season, <laughs> uh, once again by one goal. Uh, so, you know, nothing really much to talk about there. Bournemouth won, Watford won, Jorelio Gomez with a sensational save for oh, to keep Watford in the game, really, because he saved yeah. the penalty uh, yeah. in, towards the dying embers of the game, uh, which actually ruined my Super 6. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Gomez. Uh, d- 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 well, <laughs> City 6, Newcastle 1. Uh, Norwich 1, Leicester City 2, Leicester finally, I say finally, uh, reviving themselves after last week. Uh, and Norwich, you know, quite unlucky, really. They're, they're having quite an average start to the season. They're doing all right, but Leicester just overpowered them. Sunderland 2, uh, West Ham United 2. I yeah. predicted that. Um, <laughs> Chelsea 1, Southampton 3, Everton 1... Liverpool won, Merseyside derby of boredom, uh, <laughs> Arsenal 3, United nil, and Swansea City 2, Spurs 2. Was They're it back. the return of Swansea City? Oh, I hope so. I think uh, the best thing but, about that game was the Sony players hit form. I think Montero assisted Ayu to grab a goal, Eriksen got two goals which means he's back in form. Shelby got an assist, which means he's back in form. And Harry Kane scored again, which means he's back in form. Yeah, but for the wrong team. But still, at least you put it in the back <laughs> of the net. The finish was exquisite. Have your five goals, Aguero. I'd rather finish like that for one. <laughs> Did he actually uh, get minus points for that? That's a bit harsh. He got... Minus two for an own goal. <laughs> <laughs> he ended the game on zero. Yeah, right. So, um... That's that's that for the results. Uh, let's go for my three, three yep, three. Uh, the, these are all managerial things because we've had a lot of managerial, not necessarily changes as such yet, but it is a change because they've left. So, well, actually, this one hasn't. How long has McLaren got? Now, last week, some of you may remember me saying that Newcastle have to win this month and they needed to get an OK result against Manchester City. Now, losing 6-1 is not an okay result against Manchester City. <laughs> uh, so, basically, Newcastle are left in the predict- predicament where I feel like they have to win every single game this month. Actually, you know, it's like they have to be unbeaten for the rest of the month for McLaren to keep his job. What do you think about that, Kurt? Norwich at home, which is, you yeah. know, that's doable. That, 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 no, it's a tough game still, though. It's a very tough game still. Uh, I'd, not, say, not I'd say they could get a point. They could get a point, Norwich. Uh, so I think Newcastle have got a chance uh, at home. It will help them. Sunderland away, which is huge. 
That's uh, a massive game. To be honest, I think that's where jobs could be won and lost. Yeah. Definitely. That, that, that is a huge game, especially um, as my next point will be about Advocate, uh, but we'll get onto that in a minute. And then to end off the month, we've got Stoke at home. Yeah, now that Stoke game and that Sunderland game are the two games that really stick out for me because, of course, Stoke, have, you know, they've not done too well so far this season, but Sunderland, is that that's the game of the season so far. I mean, it's going to be a lovely nil-nil draw. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, actually, there's something that Sunderland-Newcastle never fails, and that is an entertaining game. Uh, well, I say that. They're free, free draw, I'm thinking of, a few years ago. And then Sunderland 5, uh, Norwich. Uh, Norwich, Newcastle 1, when Paolo Di Canio was in charge. Uh, but, yeah, uh, that's... I, I don't think McLaren's got long, as I've said, but... We'll move on now to the other side of Tyneside. Is it Tyneside? I think it's Tyneside. Um, Dick Advocate has left, uh, finally. Big Dick gone. Big, the, the Big Dick Advocate's <laughs> gone. Uh, Dick Advocate's gone, and I, it was going to happen sooner or later. Uh, I'm surprised that Advocate kept his job for less time than Newcastle, but he has said quite uh, iconically that... The Sunderland squad isn't good enough. It's got a um, point. I mean, they are shocking. No, yeah, I, I would agree. But he's got players that don't want to play for him. Like, Defoe didn't want to play because he was basically pushed out to the wings. I think and... they still have a player called... Uh, they signed from Inter Milan called Alvarez. No, no, no. He's gone back to Inter Milan. Oh, OK. Never mind. Yeah. Uh, but he, he was decent last year, Alvarez. Yeah. But... Yeah, uh, Sunderland's fixtures, that, well, they've got coming up. So they really need a manager, like... It by 10 days' time. Because uh, they've got West Brom away, which is going to be a tough game because it's a Pulis side. Um, and then they've got Newcastle, which is the biggest game of their season probably so far. Yeah. Uh, then Everton, which Lukaku could run right in. And then Southampton. So they're not easy games at all. And Sunderland, if they're going to stay up this year... They need to get something from one of these games. And I'm not talking about a point. I'm talking about they need to win one of these games. Like, massively. Well, I think they'll win the Newcastle um, derby. Because something yeah. that Sunderland have done well over the years is sacking their manager right before the derby, bringing a new manager <laughs> in, and their first win as new manager is in the derby. Poyet did it. Um, Di did, did it. it. An advocate did it. Whoever comes in, who I think the bookie's favourite at the moment is uh, Moise. Yeah, I've, I'm just looking at uh, Moise as the current favourite, but I, I've got my own boss that I think is going to take the job. But We'll get on to that in a sec, I suppose. Yeah, yep. But I think it's definitely um, uh, it's definitely something that needs to, well, something needs to happen because they are in deep, deep trouble. They're in yeah. deep do do uh, at the moment uh, I don't think they're going to stay up at this rate I actually I, said it at the start of the season I think it's too late they need a lot of signings at, um, January, in January and at most they need Pulis or Allardyce and I don't think they're going to get Allardyce well that is actually who I my favourite to take the job would have been oh. he's well I wouldn't say the favourite to take the job he's the one that Ellis Short uh, is the name of the Sunderland director I believe yeah, uh, but he's the one that they need. Yeah, they because need him. despite me absolutely despising Sam Allardyce's way of football, he did get West Ham back up, and he did solidify us in the Premier League. And that is credit where credit is due. Yeah, Sunderland need that Pulis type, that Sam Allardyce type, to keep them in the boss. Now, when you think of players, uh, sorry, uh, managers to keep you in a division, Allardyce is probably the best of the best. Yeah. Pulis is up there, um, and so is like Pardew, but Pardew, I'd say, is on a different... He's the other end of the scale. He's not someone that keeps you in the league. He can actually push you on as well. But if you're looking for someone to just simply keep you in the division, Allardyce is your man. And Sunderland, if you're going to get someone to keep you in the division, you need to be willing to pay Allardyce what he asks for, which is a hell of a lot of money, I'll tell you that. He yeah. was actually in the top 10 most paid white managers at West Ham in the world. Well, you pay, uh, you're basically paying for your club to get a secure spot in the Premier League. Yeah, and th that is a lot of money, to, to be said. Like, yeah. That is a ridiculous amount of money to keep your team in the Premier League 
with all the TV rights and everything, you're looking at a good 40 million just for the TV rights alone. Yeah. So, you know, it, you need to be looking at definitely getting in Allardyce. And I would say, actually, I wouldn't say the same about Newcastle because I know how badly Newcastle treated Sam Allardyce. Uh, so I wouldn't see him going back there. If anything, he, I, he would only go to Sunderland just to spite Newcastle. <laughs> definitely. Uh, Sign Kevin Nolan. No, 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 because um, Sunderland uh, know that they wouldn't t- sign Kevin Nolan because of what Kevin Nolan did to them a number of years ago where he scored a hat-trick and rubbed it in their faces somewhat. Uh, with James but, and Steve. Yeah, Sunderland, you need to be looking at someone like Sam Allardyce. I don't think Moisey is the solution, I'm afraid, because Moisey is someone a bit like Pardew where he can push your team on if you're in that sort of mid-table position, but he can't... I won't say he can't keep you up, because he can, but you have a look at Pardew, what he did at Newcastle last year when he got sacked. He's the same sort of manager as Moisey, I would say. Yeah. Keep a mid-table team pushing up, but you can't keep a mid-table team from going down. Um, yeah. But that's all I've got to say about the Art Advocate replacement. I think it should be Allardyce if they want to stay in the league. Well, another one, uh, well, the two favourites for most betting sites um, everywhere, uh, Allardyce is favourite. Shortly behind him, Nigel Pearson. Uh, I would say that Nigel... The thing with Nigel Pearson is he's actually a bit of a thug when you think of it. Are you an ostrich? Yeah. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) uh, He's a bit of a thug, and he could probably strike fear into a few managers but I don't think he's the man to keep them in the league because he did do well at New Leicester last year but the thing is that he had at Le- Leicester is momentum mm. they had a lot of momentum and they had a pacey team whereas I don't feel like Sunderland have that momentum or that pace Yeah, I don't um, so <sighs> Sunderland need to get in a man that's going to win them a few games even if it means that they park the bus for 90 minutes and get the odd goal <laughs> Uh, what does surprise me, though, is why Advocate left after drawing 2-2 with West Ham. Uh, because that is actually not a bad result based on West Ham's away form this season. But he did yeah. say that he is leaving a sinking ship. So, you know, captain's leaving the sinking ship. So I, I think Sunderland's still going down. No matter who they bring in, they're still going down. I think, to be honest, they're a lost cause. And for me, even though they signed players, Villa are a lost cause. Newcastle are the only team in the current bottom three that can fight up for me because they've, they've got the team um, to fight up out of relegation. Because if you can get you know, Mitrovic firing, who's a, a number nine I like, big, can bully defenders, bully, 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 bully defenders. Um, <laughs> I love bullies. Um, the people that can bully people, you know, over and over again, just bullying in general. I just love it. And um, that was inside joke. Yeah, no, I, I've I've got it. <laughs> I had to get it out at some point. Um, I, I was just sitting here at first. I was like, I was like, yeah, yeah, bullies, yeah, bully players like Carol. And then I, I was starting to think about it. I was like, he's not thinking about Andy Carroll, is he? <laughs> <Just> <laughs> but you know, when you got Mitrovic there, you got Wijnaldum. If they can get what seems to be one of the biggest wastes of money this signing or this season um Florian Talvin I think his name is <laughs> I have yeah, no Talvin. idea how he's worth over, like double figures in the millions yeah awful no, no, signing he's been terrible so far but also you've got <laughs> players like Musa Soko as well you've got a need to sit back they've got a decent team they can just get them pushing forward they've got a chance yeah, no, uh, Newcastle do have a chance, just like they have a chance every year to stay in the division, uh, and they probably will this year. Yeah. If they replace their manager in enough time, uh, I'm afraid the Wally with the Broly isn't good enough, but <laughs> um, they've got some fantastic players. Like, Musa Sissoko can, he can run a game in that midfield. He can really he's a player. Players. He can, <laughs> he's a player that reminds me a lot like uh, Yaya Toure, Cheku Kiyate, those sort of big, massive animals Bullish. in the midfield. Bullies. They're bullies in the midfield. But anyway, we'll move on to, uh, I would say, one of the less so surprises of the week. Brendan Rodgers finally getting the sack and the man to replace him. Well, there's no debate about it. I mean, I'm looking at the odds. I mean, that you got the, the, the four close runs. You've got 20 to 1, uh, Frank De Boer, 20 to 1, yeah. Jurgen Klisman. 
uh, 12 to 1, Carl Angelotti, and then 1 to 50, Jurgen Klopp. I don't think he's favourite though. I don't get. I just think he's maybe got like a slight edge. Don't know what it is. Uh, uh, I wouldn't like it if Klopp went to Liverpool just because of that close thing that I have with Borussia Dortmund <laughs> and the fact that I despise Liverpool. But you know he will do very well there. Uh, but I mean he had a very bad year, year last year with Dortmund with all those sensational players. So maybe the hype is not. As good as it could be, I don't know. I do think it it it, well, it probably is a, a, the right step for him because you compare Borussia Dortmund, a team you know that the fans you know that will get behind it. It's, it's a cauldron of a stadium. You think of Liverpool not like a few years ago, like when they were in Champions League and that sort of time, they had a cauldron in Anfield that did not stop making noise from 30 minutes before kick off to 30 minutes after kick off. You know, yeah. it was a, it's a cauldron of noise. You got very passionate fans. You had a passionate manager. Klopp would walk into that and fit. You know, the old Liverpool sort of um, you know build manager, just point for point. You know, word for word, action for action. He is what Liverpool would call a perfect replacement. But the big question is, does he show great character? <laughs> does I, I I think that Jurgen Klopp is a very good manager. To be honest, um, yeah. I think he'll do well at Liverpool. He'll he'll be able to inspire some players because he's someone that reminds me a little bit like Bilic. He's very passionate. He's very passionate about football, and he's very. Um, I'm trying to think of the word. Um, I'm not going to say excitable, but it's like that. Yeah. Um, I know what you mean. <laughs> When it comes to football and you think of Klopp, he's just mental. He, he'll he be on that touchline and he'll be pushing on his players by running up and down and things like that. And I think that it's what Liverpool need, to be honest. However, I do also... Well, actually, I did say I don't think they'll get Klopp at first, but it seems pretty set in stone that he's going to join. My other tip was the old Marseille manager. Uh, uh, who Bielsa, left it? Biesla, yeah. yeah. Biesla. Uh, he was my other tip. But, you know... Um, it's only talk at the moment, of course. So yeah, there's nothing in. Set in there's stone. nothing set in stone, but I think that it's going to be very interesting the next few days and actually the next ten days because I know that Liverpool want to like announce their manager by Friday, um, yeah. because you know they, they wanted to have a bit of time with the players that aren't on international duty yeah. before the actual next match, which is against. Um, oh, if they got Spurs, 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 yep. Yeah. Liverpool versus Spurs, which is going to be a tough game, of course, as it always should be. But you know, having a player like Danny Sturridge in your team, <laughs> he could he can lift any team uh, now that he's back anyway. But yeah, yeah I, I'm pretty sure Klopp is set in stone. But you know, I I still think that there's an outside chance that the likes of Biesla could take it if uh, Klopp doesn't get the job. Um, yeah. Have you got anything to add to that, or? Well, when Klo oh, sorry, if Klopp comes in, what is Liverpool's best eleven? Because there's problems everywhere. If he's got a fully fit squad, who is his best eleven? See, I would say his best eleven will be to play a four-one, a four-one-two-one-two, or a four-five-one. One of those two. But with a four-one-two-one-two, -one -two, the thing is, he's got two very like sort of like to like players in the likes of Firmino and Coutinho. Of course Coutinho is going to play over Firmino, but if you had to play a 4-1-2-1-2, you would have um Klein at right back, Sacco and Skirtle because why would you play Lovren? <laughs> uh left back you'd have Moreno, right, CDM CDM <laughs> you would have uh Milner/Henderson. Uh I would say more so Milner because I think Henderson is very very creative. In the yeah. middle of midfield, uh, you'd also probably have Firmino in centre mid, and then in CAM you'd have Coutinho, and then up top Ings and Sturridge all the way. No Benteke if he's fully fit. No Ben, no Benteke. No Benteke. Wow. Because um, wow. that Ings and Sturridge partnership could work out like Suarez and Sturridge, but I'm not comparing Ings to Suarez, of course. Uh, however, Sturridge and Benteke could still work. Big I'm not saying that man. that won't work. Yeah. Well, it's not even that small storage when you think of it. Big but, man, pacey uh, man. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> pace a little uh, pace and a little bit of pace. <laughs> but yeah, I mean that could work. That would be our, Liverpool's best eleven, I'd say. Uh, oh, and of course you gotta have a uh, mini lane goal because they've got no other choice. What about Bogdan? How dare you? Bogdan's big and ginger, <laughs> which means he's sensational, by the way. Um, so I guess we'll move on to. Uh, we'll do my last topic before we move on to yours, Kurt. Yay! Uh, well, actually, it's a <clears throat> breaking news. Blatter has been suspended for ninety days. Hallelujah! 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 Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's only ninety days. Uh, it's a start, though. It, it is a start. Uh, how he's been in the job for, God knows how many years, is absolutely ridiculous. But <laughs> you know, I hope he gets found out. I hope he gets ex- expedited. Um, and I hope he gets arrested. Yeah. Because he's ruining football. Yeah, actually, no, that's actually harsh. If he's guilty, I hope he gets arrested. If he's not guilty, then he doesn't need to be arrested. But, you know, he does have to step down. So he, no matter what. Mean he needs to be arrested because there's no way he cannot be guilty. Yeah, I know, I know. But he, he, he has to step down. He's ruining football. He's killing football. He has been for the good last 10 years. How the World Cup is going to the most racist country in the world and then going to Qatar, which is just <laughs> Well, I think the point we made terrible. in the last episode, it's a, a country that is racist and then four years later on from that is a country that's half-built. Yeah, country that's half-built in the middle of the bloody desert. <laughs> but... You know, it's absolutely ridiculous how he's still in charge. Uh, I don't think... I don't know who should run it. I think that the uh, my favourite idea, actually, was to have an outside someone that's outside of football running it. Yeah. Because it's he's got no bias towards any sort of nation or anything. You know, he's not born in Italy or something like that and, you know, a massive Italy fan. So the next World Cup's going to Italy. Um <laughs> He's just a. F- they don't want him to be a football fan. Although it would be, you know, kind of all kind of nice, but I just want them to be someone that can be independent as such. Yeah. An independent adjudicator, I guess you could say. Just someone to keep some balance, because it's just ridiculous. I wouldn't want a politician, because that'd just be stupid. Yeah, definitely. They'd be claiming. They'd be claiming for all their expenses to each match. Oh uh, well. <laughs> I had to go to the World Cup final, so you're going to have to pay me for that. Um, that that's some political views there. Uh, give me the job. Fuck me. <laughs> uh, it needs to be someone outside of football. Uh, I don't know what you've got to say on it. Uh, is there anything in particular? No, I, I, I agree. I think someone outside of football, because then there is no bias. Um, although, there is, I'll start from the bribes, but someone that won't, just someone that won't take bribes. Please, I'm begging. <laughs> I'll yeah. get on my knees. <laughs> Just anything. Anything. <laughs> Although I would take a certain characteristic, and that has to be bully. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> right, uh, moving on. What's Kurt's topic? And please don't say it's bullying. <laughs> well, as you may know, I like a big bullying number nine. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Over the weekend, we've seen Advocate resign and Rogers get sacked, which brings me on to think... Uh, so I don't like the fact that there is too much money in football. And we've seen two cases of managers leaving with or having spent a lot of money. I mean, I did. I, I said I did uh, videos on it um, before the podcast. Um, the first two I did, one was on um, Rogers, one was on Advocat. In both I said the failure, you know, has to be down to the board because... Knowing that you know Rogers isn't their most favourite man, give him eighty million to spend and sack him two months into his co- like, a new season is bizarre. That's eighty million pounds that maybe another manager would have put elsewhere. They've also let go of their best player, which is Sterling. And although a lot of criticism is given his way, he was one of Liverpool's best players as well as Advocat. He's not going to be there in a season's time. He'd already resigned. And from what I know, they basically. Well, they tried their hardest to get him back, and he did come back. But then he he said, as soon as he come back, I'll, I'll resign if I feel like you know, a better man could do or uh, someone better can do the job. And for me, you've given thirty million. They've signed like ten new players this transfer window. And once again, like Liverpool case, it's another case where they know eventually the manager's going to leave, unless they have miraculous performances. Even at the end of the season, you've signed a whole new squad for one season. 
when he's already left, you should be looking to get another manager in. Like I say, from that point, you could bring someone in that's going to sign with decent players. You've got players, you've got um, managers like you know Big Sam. You know you've got players like Ni- oh, managers, sorry, like Nigel Pearson. They're available. Managers from abroad, they can sign in a team. They can build a team that will not go down. Uh, Advocate's team, he's built. It was, it, it, it was awful. It, the signings they've made are horrific. I'm just going to get them up, hopefully on the screen, so I can talk about them quickly. But for me, it, it's just stupidity from the the board above them. Because in both cases, if I was bored of both of them, if I knew that I wasn't going to like Rodgers and a few bad results he was going to go, I would be saying that cut my losses, get rid of him now. Klopp's just left, bring him in na- Bring him in at the start of the season, because Liverpool can challenge for the top four spots, in which they can't do now. I think the top four spots for this season are over. It's a bold statement to make, but you've got to look at the fact that Chelsea eventually, I think, they've, although no team has started this badly and finished in the top four, I think Chelsea can break that trend. Man City, Arsenal, Man United have pretty much all shown they can secure their spots. You've got teams like Liverpool, as well, or Liverpool sorry, like Tottenham. You've also got Everton doing okay. You've got West Ham, Leicester and Palace who will you know, try and maybe get Europe this season, which will really make a bold statement to the teams that are flopping, as well as Chelsea pushing up there. <laughs> it's just... Money is taken over football, and it's it just shows that if something goes <coughs> wrong, you just chuck money at it. They didn't like Rodgers. They didn't like, the advocate. They knew was going to leave. They've chucked money towards them, saying do something with it. They've done something with it. They've left, so they're going to chuck money to get them all, um, away, or in Rodgers' case, chuck money to get them away. Then you've got to chuck money at a new manager who's going to chuck money, you know, out of other players and other teams in the January transfer window. All for they could have cut their losses, and you know not even spent 80 million. I mean Liverpool signings weren't the best in general. I think one the best player and the only good player they've signed is Klein, Klein and Milner. For me, it's just money is taking over, and I think from a football fan's perspective, it's ruining football. And that scene because like I said in my video, Sunderland and Liv- Sunderland and Newcastle um, out of the top European leagues were in the top 15 clubs that spent the most, and they're on three points each after eight games. <clears throat> yeah, no, I did see that. Uh, I would say that football uh, is controlled by money these days, uh, but it also does show that money can't buy you everything. Yeah. Because you look at the likes of Juventus, their midfield has cost them nothing, yet they're dominating the <laughs> They're dominating Serie A last the past few years anyway, not this year, but for uh, that's going on to a different tangent completely. Uh, Sunderland and Newcastle have spent some of the most money this year, and they're in the bottom three of the table, gaining no wins. It shows that money can't buy you everything. And to be honest, like although football is controlled by money these days, it's nice to see that they spent all this money, and they're not succeeding. Like QPR didn't succeed as well to spend despite all the money they spent. I prefer to see that rather than Man City, who have bought the league quite a few times, and Chelsea and uh, Man U, they've yeah. all bought the league. Um, it's nice to see that money doesn't always work, as far as I'm concerned. Like, I would rather... I wouldn't say I'd rather money didn't work. <laughs> I would rather have it that there was... It worked for some teams, and then for some teams it just like threw them it out, just getting relegated, for all I care. Yeah, uh, definitely. Make make them pay for what they've done, right? <laughs> but you know, it's just something that's going to come back and bite them in the ass because they've not bought a good enough squad. I mean, Sunderland's best signing is Jermaine Lenz by far. Yeah. Now he's on another level compared to a lot of those players. However, you cannot build a team on one player because yeah. Lenz is not going to carry your team. He's a good signing, but he's not going to carry your team week in week out. He's not. Like I'm not comparing him to these players, but he's not like Sanchez or or Aguero. He's not going to constantly be feeding you goals, or he's not like David Silva, more like because he's a midfielder like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, That's all. That's all I want to say on it, uh, because bloody stupid people with their stupid money that they're paying. Well, you look at the the signing Sunderland make. They've got Lenz in um, eight million, Barini in seven and a half. Kabul in three million, Virginia in two million, Matthews a Celtic right back in two million, Quartes in from Liverpool centre back two million, and Vila on loan, Yedlin on loan, Torbjorn on loan, 
you look at that and think uh, Jermaine Lenz is on the same level, but you know, they let Colin Wickham go. Seven yeah, well, that, pounds. That, that, and that just shows lots. shocking business because all of their all their players. I don't. I think I'd rather not have you know any of them players and keep Connor Wickham because I think he's a quality striker. It's the same for you know Newcastle. As much as they've bought well, which now is good signing. Mitrovic is a good signing. I think Mbemba isn't Premier League ready. We've seen that. Talvan isn't Premier League ready. And you look at who they've let go. Uh, Santon's gone. I think he was a quality fullback, and Gutierrez has left, and I think he was a quality winger. And they're two players they're going to miss, just like Sunderland will miss Wickham, and we're seeing that now. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that completely. I, I feel that Sunderland are missing, uh, uh, both teams actually, are uh, missing some key players that they've got rid of. Um, and I'm just glad it shows that money doesn't always buy happiness. Yeah. And like I, in football, anyway. Um, yeah. Definitely. It's good to see that it can't save every team. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, it's been proven before, let, let's face it. I mean, with the likes of um, QPR, uh, they basically bought their Premier League safety a few times and then they went down. Uh, even with the likes of uh, um, that geezer, Charlie Austin, um, yeah. scoring them goals for days. He, they still went down. That shows how poor their team actually was. And that is once again going to be shown this year with the Sunderland and maybe Newcastle team. I think Newcastle got the best chance of anything, but it's not looking good. No, just like for Chelsea. I, I Although you say they're going to get top four, and I think I've probably said it as well. Um, I like your idea. Um, I am uh, Thank you. not too sure on if they're going to get top four. I think they might end up doing a Man United, dropping out the top four for a year, and then having a year where they really go at it yeah. uh, at the league. But then, then And then they'll push into the top four again like Man U. But anyway, that's all I want to say on that. Um, anything else you want to add, or should we move on? Because this has definitely gone into over an hour. Well, to, for me, money is bullying football. <laughs> <Dear>. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, so last two points, thankfully, for you that Ooh. stayed here. Um, thank you, Mr. McCarthy. Uh, <laughs> the only one. So, uh, more breaking news. Emil Fatano has left West Ham by mutual consent. Uh, he fell out with Bilic at the start of the season and has not had a look in since. He's been training him with the reserves. We finally released him. I quite liked Emil Fatano as a player. I thought he brought something different to the West Ham team. However, he is... I, uh, blah, 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 blah. He's, he's still good enough for the West Ham team. He'd be a good bench warmer, but he probably wants to play every week. So, you know, it was probably good for his career that he left. But, hmm. yes, yeah, you know, it's quite sad to see him go because I didn't mind him. But, you know, after you've had a falling out, falling out with Billich, you're not going to get back into the team. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't I wouldn't mess with Billich, to be honest. It's the hell <laughs> I wouldn't mess with Billich. Just just <laughs> look at him. <laughs> he's still scared of you. Um... Uh, my final thing is uh, just an interesting bit of gossip that I saw. Uh, not sure if it's true, but um, Mourinho, uh, if he was to get sacked by Abramovich, we could, which could be the reason why he's still in charge, could apparently be owed £35.5 million. I would say that again. If he's sacked, he could be uh, owed £35.5 million. Well, to be honest, it would be a very you smart move it. from him. Going back yeah. into Chelsea with Mr. I'm going to sack people for days, Abramovich. Yeah, I mean, he did he recently sign a new deal? Like a five year deal or something? I don't know, really. Because you think of it, a five year deal on the wages that he probably earns, <laughs> that's a lot of money. Uh, and that could be the only reason why he still has the job, uh, to be honest. Uh, uh, Jose but... Mourinho, Chelsea boss signs new four year deal. Um, that was at the 7th of August 2015. So there we go. Four-year deal. Signed a new four-year deal just before the start of the season. And now now look where he's got them. I, to be honest, I think that, that now I know that, that's probably the reason why he hasn't been sacked. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, 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 that is something that I've, you know, that I've just sort of noticed when I was going through the gossip. I was like, oh, God, is that true? Like, Jesus. <laughs> They're stuck with him. And that's um, the reason why he's not going to resign. He's like... Even if I lose every week, every time I lose, I earn more money than you earn in your lifetime. Shut up, haters. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's just an interesting fact. I thought you'd bring you all. Uh, but 
I, that's all I've got to say this week. Uh, next week is the international break, so get prepared for one of the most boring podcasts ever. You might even make it to the end if you actually. No, you no, might. There's no point me saying this because no one's made it to the end except Thomas. Mc- Could you relay this message in the comments, Mister Thomas McCarthy, to everyone that doesn't make it to the end? <laughs> um. So yeah, this is going to be a interesting next week because say, I have a everyone few hates fun things planned out for next week. Oh, okay. Um. Am I still going to host it? You know, I've, I think I've done all right. Mr. Stelling me. Well, to be honest, let's, I'll, I'll let you use a bit of a backstory here, everyone. So, basically, one person. Um, the reason Joe hosts this week is because he bullied me into making the decision. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, I'm saying uh, nothing else. I right. speak no more. I didn't bully him into the decision. I <laughs> asked him if I could host this week. Just, you know, chuck a, chuck a spanner in the works, confuse everyone. You know, when I introduce it, they're expecting Kurt's voice, and then they hear, what is going on, ladies and gentlemen? And they're like, what? No. What? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like this. Change. <laughs> chuck a spanner into the works, and that spanner's called Bully. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> this has been the podcast. I hope you've all enjoyed it. I, I hope you've enjoyed it, Mr. McCarthy. Uh, I... <laughs> I hope that you're um. You get, he gets a shout out every week. Let's face it. Come on. Hey, I'm a YouTube we, channel. We, we do bless him. We do bless him. <laughs> if you had Quite a YouTube nice. channel, you had 200 subscribers by now. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. 200 subscribers. <laughs> but yeah, I hope you all enjoyed it. I hope you all listened uh, to our points and uh, have taken them all in. You know, agree with them all. Because if you don't, just leave the channel. Uh, <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Right. Uh, uh, this is Gingy X signing off. I'll leave the last bit to you, Kurt, because you always do the same to me. Banter with James and Steve. Is that it? I thought you were going to carry on the next line. N- no. <laughs> well. Oi, oi. <laughs> Peace. <laughs>